From the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, this is NATO 20 2020, a new podcast series pitching fresh ideas for the world's oldest military alliance. I'm your host, Terry Schultz, and I've been covering NATO for more than a decade. So I know a lot about how the alliance has been doing things, but this podcast is about how NATO could be doing things differently. The Atlantic Council commissioned a series of 20 recommendations as to how the 70-year-old alliance could freshen up a bit heading into the next decade. Some of these ideas are ones we've heard before. Some of them are brand new. All of them are aimed at making the alliance more responsive and resilient to the threats that definitely get more creative all the time. So I'm going to be digging into those ideas with their authors. And in this week's episode, the recommendation is that NATO should open its own bank. The authors are Max Bergman and Sielina Ciccarelli, both from the Center on American Progress. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to start off here, um, of course, with money issues, which we talk about all the time at NATO. And that's why I had so much fun with this recommendation. So underlying your pitch here, and you can you can lay this out in more detail and correct me if I'm if I'm misstating it. You said that we should all be thinking along the lines of sort of the World Bank or the European Investment Bank and that allies could make an initial investment in a NATO bank um, along the lines of their GDPs. So, of course, the first thing that comes up in my mind as someone who's covered the 2% debate forever and a day is why should we be thinking they're going to put any percentage of their GDPs in a bank in yet another institution when they won't even put put money into their own militaries as they have pledged to do with the, at the Wales summit. So tell me how this is going to work. Just start us off here. So no, that's a gr well, great question. And I, I think the reason why is that, uh, that they can, the, the whole concept of the bank is that you can leverage assets that you have and, and make, make your money go further. So by putting in uh, a small amount a smaller amount of funds, you can actually make that money go further. Uh, and given the credit ratings of European countries, that it would actually, you know, if you were going to give- Which are uh, pretty high, we should point out for the most part. Yeah, which, which are which are pretty high. Well, especially in, in Western Europe, Northern Europe, uh, in the United States and Canada. And that you could use, the, the concept is that, but it's the, the, you know, the credit worthiness of some Eastern European members isn't as high. And so what you would be doing here is that, you know, the concept would be you would be trying to get a triple A credit rating for this bank. Uh, and let's say the bank wanted to lend $10 billion. Well, you don't have to put up $10 billion in our conversations with uh, financial experts, people uh, associated with uh, some global financial institutions that you could probably put up 10%. So maybe a billion dollars. And then amongst the allies would need to allocate that funding, raise that funding. Um, and so the, the idea is that then that money would go to alliance priorities that may fall between the cracks, um, such as military mobility, such as uh, getting trying to get countries off of Russian equipment that are still operating them uh, in Eastern Europe. OK, um, Sienna, did you want to add anything to that sort of basic, basic presumption on which we start? Yeah, um, another thing that I would add is. The reason we're so excited about this idea and the reason why we think that it might make countries invest in the bank and when they're so hesitant to put the full 2% in is it allows them to use their money a little bit more creatively. And maybe that's an easier sell, honestly, to their governments back home. So although maybe the bank at its like first few projects is just investing in military mobility, we could encourage it to think a little bit broader and go a little bit further. So if it wanted to invest in emerging technologies, or if they wanted to, to do a project on 5G, that's something that the bank could, if the gov uh, governing board decided that that was a priority, decide to do. And maybe that would encourage countries to make that investment and to take the leap when it's not just buying planes, buying tanks, buying Patriot missile air defense systems. But they've already got banks. I mean, I'm sorry if this is an overly simplistic question, but why do they need another bank to do this? They have national banks that all these countries do have access to, to capital, but the cap, the interest rates at which countries may be able to borrow. So if you're an uh, Eastern European country, your in, the interest rate in which you may be able to borrow to finance uh, a national defense project 
uh, may be much higher than, the, than hopefully the NATO bank would offer. Uh, so the concept here is that you're providing sort of low interest financing. You know, one of the, the, the roots of this idea actually came from when I worked at the State Department uh, and I worked in the, uh, on uh, issues revolving around security cooperation in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. And there, one of the problems that kept coming across were middle income countries that like wanted to buy US F-16s and the US would have gladly you know, want them to modernize the Air Force and have a more modern defense capability, but they were too wealthy to be given grant assistance from the United States, uh, but they were too poor to buy them outright. And so what happened is that there's a little bit of a donut hole for middle income countries where they, they kind of need a first time mortgage to be able to make these acquisitions. And they would come and ask the US, do we, could we get financing for this from the US government? Uh, and actually the US government stopped doing military financing for, uh, for sort of various reasons, mostly just sort of bureaucratic. Uh, and so they can't get loans for these. And there, this, the few times the US has, for example, provided loans, so, such as for Poland's F-16s acquisition in the early 2000s, it's been really beneficial. And so the idea here is that maybe a, maybe a country could go to a national bank or to another private bank and borrow. But there are oftentimes in the defense world where that's just something a, a, a bank isn't going to lend to, uh, to do certain activities. And so you would want to go to a, a NATO specific or, or, you know, having a NATO specific bank that could provide to, you know, targeted or discrete uh, 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 lending focus on a particular priority and make that cash available at, 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 um, at low interest rates um, would be something that would be quite appealing and could, could fill this niche in the market. That is the hope and that's the idea. Um, and that you would generate demand for native, for these smaller countries to start uh, investing in certain capabilities because they could suddenly get access to cash. Okay, I'm going to turn around an argument that we hear in this town a lot. Uh, I cover both sides of it. So I cover the European Union and I cover NATO across town. Now, when permanent structured cooperation got off the ground a couple of years ago, NATO squealed so loudly about how this was going to be redundant, how it was going to be duplicative. And I'm just going to point out that by far, most of the countries in NATO, and certainly the ones I would expect you're talking about, are also members of the European Union, and they do have banks. They do have um, investment um, with European Union structures. And so why in this case would you need to create another bureaucracy um, for something that, that a, a European government could go, could could get money in other ways. And remember that all their budgets, we should point this out from the from the very top, many people will know this, but not all, that all of the investments that we're talking about are done as national governments and certainly not through NATO. Um, you know, there are a few joint projects, but um, you know, the, the vast majority of investments in their militaries are done as national governments. So they're handling it um, in any way necessary. And that might be by, by using, you know, money that, um, that they get many of the many of the Eastern European countries. I think all of the Eastern European countries are net takers from the European budget, and they can use that money in in ways that they deem necessary. And especially with the EU putting more of an emphasis all the time on its own defense, um, thanks in large part to the Trump administration. Um, you know, again, how why is there not another method that already exists without setting up another layer of bureaucracy? Sure. Um, I'll take a first crack at it. We did, you raise a really, really good point. We did look at the existing sort of financial mechanisms within the European Union when we were doing the initial research for this work. And although obviously PESCO is something that we are in favor of, I think personally and as academics at the Center for American Progress, it really hasn't gotten off its feet yet. And at its current sort of, at its current status, I don't think it's prepared to make these large scale investments. I would just really point out that you're here. talking about, you're starting up talking about starting something from scratch. So you might be thrown in that same basket if you were to start a new bank, right? Yeah, that's a fair point. But I mean, also we're hoping, we sort of looked at the evolution of the European Union's budget, especially over the last couple of months. And although we would love for them to put lots of money into defense, they have a lot of other priorities. They've um, economic recovery, post-COVID, global health, lots of things. 
it might be better if there was a separate mechanism that would not require us taking from the EU budget. But I'll let Max step in if he has a better argument to play against the EU. No, I, you know, I don't. I don't think this is uh, redundant to EU capabilities, or, or you know, with Pesco, a lot of the investments of Pesco are going to try to innovative, uh, you know, new collaborative defense projects. And some of the funding from the NATO bank could also go to support that, those efforts. However, I think the way we really envision the NATO bank is uh, filling, filling some lending gaps, that tr being the lender, be providing that sort of first time, uh, you know, the way I think of it is oftentimes if you're trying to buy a house or renovate your house, you need to go to a bank to borrow. Oftentimes, and, and when you're trying to overhaul, for, for instance, uh, air, your your fighter aircraft fleet or your uh, or your tanks or wheeled vehicles that you have in certain Eastern European militaries that are remain dependent on on Soviet and Russian equipment. Well, how do you find the capital to actually make you know the massive acquisitions needed to build buy new air force? And that doesn't that you know you're not going to have that out of your national budgets. You would need to actually borrow that money, much as when I bought my house, I needed to borrow a massive amount of the sum from a bank and then could gradually pay it back. Uh, and so I think it's a similar concept that it, when you're make, trying to do massive overhauls, that you need to think bigger in terms of the financing you're providing. The other thing I would just point out is that the underlying concept of NATO, uh, and, and frankly, not just NATO, but 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 alliance cooperation, US uh, European cooperation on defense has been rooted on effectively America being the, the, the bill payer. In World War I, before America stepped in, it was JP Morgan providing you know, the cash to sustain an allied war effort. And it was Lend-Lease that came through for, uh, for the UK, for the Soviet Union and other allies. Um, but you know, the whole point of having a structured alliance is that you've figured things out and how to cooperate. And it shouldn't be just up to the United States that if NATO got it in itself into uh, a military contingency and there was a real financial crisis as a result of that and a country NATO member needed financing, well, we're, who's providing the money? And that's the true in any conflict from the American Revolution with the French providing aid to the United States. And NATO hasn't really thought about that. We don't bring finance ministers together. We don't have a vehicle through NATO that could actually then say, OK, this is what we're going to do to finance this NATO effort. And so I think there's also sort of a broader strategic planning effort here uh, to to build to build the NATO bank. So I don't I think and I think that goes hand in hand with the war fighting element uh, that uh, is not right now the European Union's focus and European Union's responsibility. So that it, this brings up just a couple of points. I will say that um, after meetings of uh, especially the defense ministers, you often hear them say, I wish I had, could bring my finance minister here, you know, and, and they could hear the arguments that are being made because then it's always their job to go back home and try to sell the ideas that are, you know, sort of passed at, at the meetings. But one thing that Sienna said that, um, again, I bring I bring back to the sort of duplicative angle and that is that, it, again, it's the same governments. If they're having financial difficulties because of, because of COVID um, on some of their responsibilities, it doesn't matter which side of town they're standing on, on the EU side or the NATO side, they're the same governments with the same budgets, with the same resources, with the same COVID uh, caused, you know, financial concerns. So um, I think that 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 argument doesn't really work for me that that it would it would sort of be easier to put the money into a nato bank than than to handle it in in other ways but i do take your point and i think this is important that that the mindset is completely different when they're at nato and and that targeting any money that is available would would certainly be easier uh, uh, you know, targeting any military investment that's needed would certainly be easier when they when they're discussing things at NATO. And I, I would also say that when this was this was really interesting um, when the pandemic hit and at at the EU when they were arguing endlessly over who would help whom and did they have money to help Italy? You just you know did they have money to um, to help Spain? Um, and, and in some cases, they came up with no. They didn't have extra equipment. They weren't going to, you know, provide um, provide some resources. 
And Na at NATO, some of the same government suddenly came up with PPE, you know, somewhere back in a warehouse, and it was flown down to NATO before, you know, the EU even finished its argument. So there is definitely something to the idea that things work more smoothly at NATO many times than they do at the EU. Um, but I, I'm wondering how, um, how you would handle the decision-making process. So once all the money goes into the NATO bank, um, who gets to decide about it? I mean, do you have to go back to, does Germany have to go back to its parliament every time you want to write a check out of the NATO bank? So I, I think the NATO bank, the, the model would be uh, other uh, international uh, lending organizations, the World Bank, others that would have a board of directors. Um, the you know, World Bank doesn't have to go back to the United States and all its members to make a decision. Uh, and that would be sort of empowered by NATO um, to, uh, to, to make decisions and to make decisions about lending. And what would happen is that NATO would sort of develop the capabilities and requirements and things that they were looking for the bank to finance. And then it would be up to the bank to make determinations about, uh, you know, whether to finance certain requests and certain uh, bids that, that come in. Um, and I think, you know, in regards to just your point about the EU, I actually think that now a uh, NATO bank is, is more necessary than ever because of, I think, we're going to see real downward pressure on defense budgets. And there's, you know, I think finance ministers are going to look at defense and, and you know, 2% is going to be very difficult to reach and it's just probably not going to happen. In fact, we should hope that defense spending is stabilized. But one way you could stabilize it is by providing uh, cheap capital to especially countries that really need to make investments. I mean, this wouldn't include countries like Germany, but it might include countries uh, in the eastern part or, or in southern Europe to that, that here's access to keep to, to cheap capital that you can pay back later, but that has to go into your defense uh, forces. And so that might uh, be able to maintain uh, uh, defense spending at, at, at acceptable levels um, while we're going to be in you know, a real budgetary crunch, not just in for the immediate period, but for the next few years. So you're talking about every country paying in proportionately per GDP into a NATO account, um, but then being able to take it out um, perhaps at a different level. I mean, because the ones who put in the least are going to need the most. So how do you work? How do you work with that? So, so basically, I think the way it would work is, is similar to any developing country uh, lending organization, where you know allotments are based off of GDP, and 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 so certain countries wouldn't have to put up any capital because they're the expected borrowers. Uh, and, but then, you know, what would happen is that you would capitalize that bank. So, let's say you wanted to lend ten billion dollars, you had to get a billion dollars from various countries. And that billion dollars doesn't have to be accumulated in year one, can be done over time. Uh, and so just as the US and Germany and others provide money to different uh, uh, international lending organizations, this would be part of that. And then the bank would go to the open market, to the bond market and, and say, okay, you know, what's our credit rating? We're probably going to be AAA credit because of the countries that are backing it. And so then the interest rate that we can then lend out would likely be very low. It might even be negative given where uh, interest rates are. And the EU, frankly, has just experienced this when um, with its COVID recovery uh, plan, uh, which is $750 billion, which finally the EU is going to go and borrow on the open uh, market. And their AAA credit rating, uh, we're given a AAA credit rating because of the credit worthiness, credit worth, worthiness of many of their members. Uh, and and so, you know, that money is intended not for Germany, not for Sweden, but for, you know, countries hit hard by COVID, uh, uh, Italy and others in, in Eastern and Central Europe. So I think the NATO bank would work similarly, but would be targeted at uh, the military and defense sectors. But if you're having trouble, if these governments are going to be having trouble convincing um, their finance ministers to keep the defense spending up, why would they be able to come up with other money to put into a NATO bank? Jenny, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, so, so I agree, I agree it, it will, will kind of be a hard, hard conversation, conversation to have. have. One, one idea. idea. Yeah, I imagine they're always hard with a finance Yeah, minister. I imagine they're always hard. <laughs> um, one, one thing that, that we had been, been floating, floating around is whether one day it could, could sort of count, count as part, part of their 2% contribution. contribution. That would be my next question. Yeah, yeah, or, or pay, pay towards, towards that. that. So, so we haven't fully, we haven't obviously, fully obviously worked out the details, gotten the sign off. But, but 
if that was if a that way to think more creatively about 2%, where instead of we're just seemingly, we're just seemingly throwing, throwing, a throwing a pot of money at an organization, an organization that, that maybe, maybe they, they don't see as completely aligned with their interests, instead we can put it in in bank, the money can grow, the money can be used to help Europe as a whole, and maybe that'll be a slightly less hard conversation. No, no. But, you know, even investments in military mobility, which everybody agrees are, are, are super essential and, and need, to, need to happen fast, those so far have not been allowed to count against the 2%. So, again, I'm just tempering your optimism on that. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think this is an area where, where you know, what is NATO for? You know, it, NATO eventually has to demonstrate to the alliance members that, uh, that it's an alliance and there's a degree of solidarity. And, um, in, you know, I am, I am actually somewhat optimistic that countries like Germany, for instance, that struggle to justify to their public uh, investments in defense, um, in, in their national defense, and there's not much support for investment in national defense. Yet, when you look at sort of polling numbers for EU defense within Germany, it's very high. And while this isn't the EU, it's NATO, I think there could be real support for collective defense investments. And I think there is a degree of like, why are we spending all this money to maintain sort of a duplicative military capability on a national level, when maybe we could pool our assets and, and get more bang for, for the buck or for the euro. And, and yeah, it's-, yeah. it's it, That's a I, whole nother, but, you know, can I, I, I do I wonder do. if Germany, if a country like Germany, might be more willing or more open or potentially open, hopefully, to uh, providing capital to uh, a multinational fund uh, that then collectivizes defense investment. Uh, and I think that I think that may be some appeal, especially look, we have a new administration that if it supported, you know, really pushing for a NATO bank, I think you'd be able to get real uh, support from uh, particularly some of the more credit worthy members of, of if, if you bring it up really quick during the honeymoon phase, right? Yeah. <laughs> honeymoon phase. Before. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I think that's, a, that's a good point. But again, um, coming back to some of the other joint purchases that NATO has made, the joint investment capabilities, um, you constantly run into this question about decision making, about who can use what, you know what I mean? And um, wh whether, what if a nation needs it and another nation needs it? Um, the sharing has not worked so well yet at NATO. There's still a lot of kinks in that system. How would that work here? Again, would, would, would these accounts be completely under the, um, you know, under the authority of what you're calling the governing board of the NATO bank? so that this, the, the, the nations wouldn't any longer have any control over the money. I mean, they may not like that, but I don't see how else you'd make quick, you know, you'd be able to make quick investments where they're needed. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it, it obviously would depend on what um, sort of investments were made. And, and Sam, I can talk about some of what we have in mind. From yeah, tell me, a, tell me a couple things on your shopping but, list. But I do think some of this would just go to be to supporting countries making national military acquisitions. So it'd be NATO providing financing, but just as like, you know, the the bank may own my house or a portion of my house, you know, you're paying it down, but the idea is that I'm also the owner. And so I think it wouldn't be sharing so much as NATO simply providing the capital to make for a lot of countries to make national investments. But Sienna should talk about some of the other ideas where I think this this NATO bank could be used. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, we've talked about this a little bit, but Max and I really looked at infrastructure investments when we were thinking about this. I mean, we talk, Max especially talks about this a lot, but the Greek port of Piraeus is an example of sort of one of those potentially dual use uh, infrastructure pieces, I guess, if you could call it that, um, where obviously major investments by China really puts Greece in a tough spot there. If those investments were made... Uh, instead by NATO that might sort of change the political calculations long term. But beyond that, I think we're really into thinking more creatively about what NATO itself is investing in long term about how to meet the challenges of today. So we're talking emerging technologies, digital technologies, 5G. Those are all things that NATO could sort of step into the space of um, if there was a financing mechanism that enabled them to do so at a joint level. Yeah, I think I think the way to think about this is that this is a tool. This is a tool to fit that could be adapted to 
help finance NATO priorities. And maybe those priorities are replacing Bulgaria's MiG fighter fleet, but maybe the priority is, look, we need to build up ports or, uh, you know, in the, in the southern, in, in the Mediterranean or rail infrastructure, or if NATO conducts an operation in North Africa and needs to help finance reconstruction, you know, 20, 10 years from now, uh, this might be a vehicle that can help finance uh, some of that. So it's it's an adaptable, we see it as an adaptable tool to sort of fit uh, NATO demands and NATO uh, requirements. I want to get back to the China question um, in a minute, but but you're talking about a lot of policy decisions that that aren't even taken by NATO at this point. Again, these are more decisions that are taken at an EU level or not even decisions, but guidance that comes out of an EU level. For example, if you're talking about selling off um, selling off key um, key defense related infrastructure, um, NATO just sort of says, uh, please don't do it. At the EU, they have the power to say that there is now um, and an reinforced uh, review process of all outside bidders for things like that. I mean, too late for the, for the Greek ports, too late for some of the Dutch ports, um, you know, and, and airfields, unfortunately, for NATO. But um, NATO doesn't have any kind of mechanism at the moment or, or even to, to deal with 5G. It just doesn't do those things at the moment. So I feel like this is so far off, you'd have to change a lot of mindsets and change the way NATO does business um, before some of the, the ways you're thinking of using this money um, would even, could even be a reality. Am I just being a Debbie Downer? I think you're being a little bit of a Debbie, Debbie Downer, but I, 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 think, um, no, I, I think your point about the EU is, is right. You know, a lot of this is the EU responsibility and the EU uh, has looked at making, um, you know, uh, strengthening its sort of investment screening, uh, what are strategic assets and, and what countries, you know, if a foreign country or outside the EU is looking to make acquisitions of potential strategic infrastructure, what does the EU do about that? Well. You know, what this is sort of proposing is that NATO also has a potential role in that, too. And that, you know, if if uh, if, you know, a Greek port operator is looking for investment and is therefore thinking about making, you know, going to the Chinese you know, with the Chinese with their you know Asian infrastructure bank is looking to then make investments. Well, how about NATO? This is, you know, gives NATO a potential tool for it to get in the game and to say, OK, well, we'll make that investment. And Greece, being a NATO member, could 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 use that. Uh, so I think p- part of it, and it's not for everything, but it, for strategic infrastructure like a port, where you you know that would presumably be used for moving military forces, perhaps in the energy sector. Sienna mentioned five G, uh, where critical to sort of protecting our our cyber and our our cybersecurity and our data. You know, those are areas where NATO. And this is you know, the idea here is not that NATO would set up whole new policy arms, but that NATO, you know, with the endorsement of the NATO you know, of NATO members, would then start to be making strategic investments uh, that could help enhance its security. I'm not. Yeah, I. It would be great if it worked. It would be much more efficient than than the way it goes now, um, where NATO. I mean, honestly, can just say we. You know. Uh, this is what we'd like to see. This is what we're worried about. We hope you'll think twice about doing such things, you know, in, in, which I'm, I'm mostly thinking about 5G and, and the sale of, of infrastructure. Um, perhaps if NATO EU cooperation actually ever were fulfilling its, its complete potential, um, th- this could work, you know, hand in hand. That the policy recommendations are some of the limitations that the EU is allowed to put on, for example, um, you know, it ordered all countries to, to, to give a review of 5G um, vulnerabilities and how they would patch them um, before they went further with, for example, purchasing Chinese, uh, Chinese parts. Um, NATO doesn't do anything like that. But what if they worked together and then there was another financing option? I don't think, you know, I don't think the EU would be sorry about that. Yeah. No, no that's... I mean, I guess, I guess Max and I are, are optimistic, I think, that maybe the two could complement each other in the long term. Maybe that is a little bit too, of too much optimism for people um, in D.C., but uh, I think we're optimistic. You know, the, mil- the military mobility budget in, in the EU got, got zeroed at one point. 
Um, right. it, first, it got completely slashed. And then they gave back a little bit of the money, but nowhere near what had been um, originally um, the hope uh, for the budgeting. Um, and that is something that everybody knows has to be done. Um, and you know, you you've got you know the military commanders saying it would take us weeks to get um, to get even European-based resources to the border. You know, when when we're thinking about the you know the border with Russia, like everything would be long gone if if you you had to rely on us you know moving our things fast enough. Um, so I would think military mobility would just be ripe for something like this. Yeah, I think in, Sienna can talk about military mobility. I mean, I think just on quickly on NATO EU cooperation. Look, I think there's there's been sort of a rivalry between the organizations for, for too long. I think the U.S. has played kind of a negative role in helping uh, foster that rivalry. And what this is an area where there could be real collaboration, where the NATO could, you know, EU can put regulations on on certain you know foreign and uh, the EU uh, could put regulations yeah EU could put regulations and NATO could could be there providing both uh, security um, input into EU. And, and then also but with this bank being able to actually do something being able to actually provide financing and it may be that the EU is like well actually maybe we'll do that well, that's great. You know, if the EU, if, if this creates a healthy competition where the EU decides, well, actually, maybe we'll create our, our, our military, military <laughs> take mobility. Take our money. <laughs> that, that's fine. Um, but I think there's a gap here. In, in mo military mobility is definitely an area uh, that that should invest in because it's a huge issue. In, well, it's one where... It, it's it's one where I think this is part of the purpose of the bank, right? Is that it's everyone's like this is a problem, and the ball is sort of thrown up in the air, but no one's saying I got it, and may, and it because this is a collective NATO response uh, concern. Whether you can get across uh, Lithuania, whether you, know, you can get from West Germany to East Germany, um, well, yeah, it's like Germany's responsibility, but on their hand, it's really. It, it, NATO loses if nothing is done. And so maybe here is a way for NATO to just step in and take care of this problem. Uh, and so that that's that's what one area where I think the bank could be particularly useful. Um, we're running close to the end of our time, but I have a, cu a couple of more questions. Um, I'm really interested in your idea that this could um, combat both Russian and Chinese influence. And we talked about that a little bit in terms of giving some other financial um, backup when, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps an asset, a government feels like it doesn't have anywhere to turn except the Chinese who are coming with open wallets or or the Russians. Um, how, but but that's also a mindset that that is a problem in Europe um, or, or I should say a, a situation anyway. Um, you know, a, a, Europe doesn't see the Chinese threat the same way. Many European countries don't see the Chinese threat the same way the U.S. does. So um, they want to keep commercial ties with China. H how are you going to deal with that, whether it's at NATO you know, or at the EU? Yeah. <laughs> We're both I, handing I, off to each other. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, well, I think it's a good point. As Mac, I think, as Max said, the best maybe we can do to start off with is to get in the game. Right now, we kind of expanded upon this idea in a broader report for CAP and looked at the existing infrastructure investment banks, although they don't necessarily invest in defense, they invest in what we could consider dual use infrastructure. And most of them are either completely backed by or majority owned or have shares by Russia and China. And if there was a world in which um, a country in Central Eastern Europe was looking to finance something and we just want NATO to be able to say, hey, instead of turning to Russia, instead of turning to a bank backed by China, here's something, here's another source of financing that is in line with the alliance's priorities, that is in line with the rest of the with the rest of Europe. And we're hoping that that can sort of start the shift uh, maybe away from those sources of financing. Yeah. And, and you know, I think back to the sort of Greece example, I mean, you know, and from Greece's perspective, it's like, look, our economy is collapsing. And here's money that is coming that is being offered by the Chinese to you know, support our infrastructure. 
Uh, and that that has particular resonance in also the nuclear industry in, in, in Hungary with nuclear power plants. And so I think, you know, the point here is that we have sort of thought that the private sector would just sort of take care of this and it wasn't really an alliance concern. But now that we're in a, a more of an era of great power competition, where we know states like Russia and China are using their economic heft and economic clout to uh, as, as tools of political influence, as tools to undermine uh, the NATO alliances to, to gain to gain uh, influence, we have to take that seriously from a from a strategic perspective, from a military perspective, from an alliance cohesion perspective. And what we haven't offered our members and, and uh, is a real vehicle to uh, to you know to counter or or alternative to taking uh, money that we don't want them to take. Uh, and I think some of that should be EU responsibility. I mean, the EU does provide a lot of uh, resources through cohesion funding and other things. Uh, but I think NATO, you know, especially when it comes to dual use assets that would be critical for any military contingency. We're not talking about just sort of, you know, every uh, type of infrastructure, but infrastructure that you really need to operate from a military alliance perspective. I think that's something that NATO should really think about getting in the game on and, and, and working to counter some of the Chinese and Russian influence that we're seeing happen within within NATO. That's a, a perfect a perfect um, answer to end on, but I can't because I have another question. Um, <laughs> I would like to leave that resonating in the air, but I have one more, um, and that is um, the article's been out now, you know, for a, a few weeks. Um, so I'm interested in in finding out what the reaction has been. I mean, because as you mentioned. This could not be done unless the U.S. thought it was a really great idea and wanted to back it. Um, but more than that, what does NATO think? Does NATO have any interest in starting a bank? Even if it was going to solve some of its problems, it's got so many, you know, it's got other things to deal with, too. So is there enough interest that somebody is really going to pick this up and run with it? Or do they need to wait for the podcast to be convinced? That's a good answer. That's a good answer, too. Yeah, yeah, they're going to have to wait for the podcast week to win. But no, <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, Sienna and I, have, have gone to NATO. We've met with uh, uh, people, you know, officials at NATO. My former boss from the State Department, Rose Gottemiller, was Deputy Secretary General. Oh, I just spoke with her. <laughs> uh, um, and, and talked to with her about this idea. And there's real actual momentum behind this idea in NATO. This isn't simply... Uh, a think tank idea that is just sort of out in the ether that has sort of no, not like other fun things. for you academics kind of thing. Yeah, we, you know, we, we're good at throwing those things out. But no, there's and there's been serious conversations about this uh, within the alliance. Um, and I've talked with this with with folks here in the U.S. government. Um, and so I, I think this is actually an idea that um, a lot, some a lot of groundwork has already been plowed um, on this. And it's something that I think could actually happen. Uh, in the near future, uh, you know, as Nate, as where you have NATO summits coming up and people are leaders are going to be looking for deliverables. I hope this is one uh, that they've been looking, <laughs> looking for. I mean, I just I, I think there's a lot of yeah, I think there's a lot of ideas in NATO. You know, the last four years, uh, a lot of folks have viewed NATO as sort of being stagnant. You know, there's a lot of fights with Trump over two percent. But p people in NATO have been doing a lot of thinking about the alliance, about the future creatively. And I think there's real ideas there. Um, I think the one challenge on the U.S. side is that, and I think this is true across European countries as well, is that while the sort of the finance minister side of this, the Treasury, totally understand the world of international lending institutions. They're, it's just they, they, that's, that's, they, you know, you would talk to them about this and be like, yeah, OK, that makes sense. But the security side, the Pentagon, the State Department, they don't do this. They, this is not a language they speak. They don't quite get financing. They don't quite get uh, the, you know, how this would work. Um, and, you know, the U.S., for instance, this is a quick tangent, has a, a program called the Foreign Military Finance Program out of the State Department, which is actually just State Department's $6 billion of security assistance, money to give to Israel, Egypt, and others. It's called financing because it used to be about lending, but we stopped doing the lending part and just give grants. And so there is this ability to provide lending, to provide finance, but we've stopped doing it. And so part of the challenge is going to be to get the bureaucracies uh, throughout NATO to come to grips with this idea and to talk not country to country, but finance ministry to defense ministry to foreign ministry 
and to get everyone to get folks in sync. And I think that requires, frankly, uh, top down direction. It requires Biden, it requires other leaders to to, to support this idea. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they will. You need to get on his on his visitors list real, really quick. <laughs> the summit, I mean, we're hearing sort of April, May. I, um, it needs to uh, it needs to be fleshed out pretty quickly because um, they're trying to get him, get President Biden over here as fast as possible. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, this has been this has been just fascinating. And um, like I said, because money is such a big issue all the time at NATO, uh, I loved thinking about these things and I loved talking to you about those. So thank you very much for joining me, Sienna Ciccarelli and Max Bergman from the Center on American Progress. And um, thank you for telling us about your ideas that NATO should open its own bank. And thank you to our audience who can find all 20 ideas at AtlanticCouncil.org. Tell us what you think on Twitter at hashtag StrongerWithAllies. Please join us next time.